Hey there, friends. I think I'm almost over this cold. It was a pretty mild one. I'm not, uh, not in the thralls of anything. Where we start, where is where I left off in the last video, is yakking about again the concept the concept of dimension in synergetics and that's just because when you learn a new language it's useful to pivot on some word that's already you've done some thinking about so you're used to thinking about that word in your own language now i don't think a lot of us walk around pondering the word dimension a lot but we do at some point in our lives usually in a math class probably but then in science fiction as well, because dimension, multi-dimension, being from another dimension, there's a lot of like plot twists that may depend on some hidden dimensions and things like that in science fiction. So it, it ranges on forward. You can read for entertainment all your life. So it's not like we're stereotypically only thinking about dimensions when we're children learning that the world is 3D, although we don't really ever fight back on that. And one of the worries around synergetics is it could start fights in the classroom, you know, and questioning of authority and so on. And I don't think that's the case. I think we've got it encased in a literate context, a literary context in American literature. And we understand about namespaces. We know that for all intents and purposes, the universe is three-dimensional, but then there's time, and then there's many coordinate systems, and they have this relativistic relationship, and there's Einstein, and, you know, all down that rabbit hole. I'm not trying to back out of that rabbit hole at all. So I'm not saying, oh, we went down the 3D rabbit hole. We need to come back and go down a different rabbit hole. It's not like that. It's like, as a scholar... You need to have space in your mind for lots of rabbit holes to coexist, peacefully coexist, like in religion and bumper stickers about religion around here in liberal Portland. They call us liberal Port Portland. We've also been called Little Beirut. Oregon is the state where we're okay with like hippie lifestyle. We've legislated that into existence and we have zoning for the country fair that could be year-round rock concert like vortex on steroids could be our asylum city model somewhere in the state but it would go ahead with state sanctions now that's a silly word right in english because sanctioned by the state means state says thumbs up it's okay we like it sanctioned but then sanctions also means clamp down um a punishment both reward and punishment of this word sanctions. Again, English messed up, all right? Lots of ways. So there's a rabbit hole you may have gone down learning English. The counter to that is not to forget English. You can't look at a language you've learned well and just not see it as making sense anymore. By the way, let me start telling you what's what's happening here. We're moving forward to version 3.8 of Python, but what this video is about does not really depend on us being in 3.8, but let's just look at this fun little snippet of code that I'll be using in class and so forth, where I assign A a value in the process of checking, ooh, we scrolled back there, that's part of my story too though. So here's an if conditional. I did have an in, a syntax error, I should show that too, to remind you that the so-called walrus uh, equals the whiskers come after the colon. The whiskers are to the right of this wal walrus face. And it's in the midst of doing an if condition, considered an expression. This whole thing evaluates to true or false. But in the middle of that, right as we're giving this expression, we are now allowed in Python to, oh, by the way, let's keep a name on this guy 1.1. We're going to need that later. So as you're writing expressions, if you know what you're doing with the walrus face, you can create some new names in the process. It's kind of an efficiency thing. And Guido fought an uphill battle. Now he's the benevolent dictator for life still at that point when he's fighting for this feature. And he does get it in, but he realizes it's more or less a level playing field now and that he had to fight really hard. And this is a good proof that there's enough strength out there 
in terms of defending the language, that this could be his one last great uh, introduction of a new feature, and he's done many, like he's been the winner. Because it's his language, yes, but then he's not, uh, he's continued to steer it with some boldness after, like, for one thing, the jump to uh, three from two, but things like um, deck raider syntax, all this stuff. So we appreciate that, and it's not done. It's like he's still working and stuff on Python. It's just there are many ways to evolve the language, and one is community, and so defining your own role, just like I'm like um, the Python to Synergetics bridge guy. That's kind of my role. American literature, Synergetics. That's what the rest of this video is about as usual. And in the last video, I was talking about some discoveries since the publication of the original two volumes from Macmillan in the late 70s, early 80s of the 1900s. Here we are in 2020. Have we learned anything new? And I'm saying in terms of the concentric hierarchy, which is kind of the backbone of synergetics. It's where we start and end. The jitterbug, but all the way down to cosmic zero, you could call it flip or inside out and come back out through negative universe, whatever that means. It's kind of like a number line, right? It's just a pulsing back and forth bow tie universe, he called it. And it doesn't matter what it means is what I'm saying right now. You can still work out. You can ride this ride in the theme park or study this deck of cards, of tarot cards, whatever. You can flash through a lot of synergetics and come out the better for it. And for one thing, because you can crack your Python teeth, meaning sharpen, meaning get stronger at Python is what I'm saying. Idiomatic phrases, you know, you can get better at Python. This just means, uh, see, so many gestures, right? And all of these could be offensive, right? I could make lots of gestures and you could worry about what am I really saying? Is this like a sign language here, right? So... If I were more of, you know, a gesticulator, that's an English word, I could get my hands involved more. It might be more interesting. On the other hand, I tend to be focused with what's on the screen. It's not trying to draw attention to myself and my face because this is not the main stage. It's up there, whatever you want to say, right? So, I'm creating these globals here. And um, I'm going to export them. In other words, what stays, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas is what we say. By, by convention, what normally happens in Python is you create a ruckus, a barroom brawl, or get married or divorced or whatever you want to. You can have a whole life inside the four walls of a function. Call it a tetrahedron because it has four walls. Inside there, everything's private except what you squirt out the end as the results of your work. Here you are. It's like the cook in the kitchen does all kinds of stuff we don't see. What we get back is the finished product, and that's the cook's proud. They like to come out and watch you eat it and see what your reaction is. They'll ask you. They'll get feedback. They care. They want to know who you are because they made this piece of art for you. And there's a natural human tendency to want to see your audience and so forth. And in Python, we export the finished product through the use of an explicit return keyword. And in a lot of languages, specifically Rust, uh, the last expression in your function is what's returned. You don't have to use a keyword return. That's considered redundant. Now, Python takes kind of an opposite approach because it has an explicit none, which is kind of like a void, but it's treated as an object like kind of an object of the nun type, right? And there's a lot of philosophy around, is that a good idea? And like Rust, for example, is like, no, 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 we don't need that. And it's important to um, talk about why not and then develop a, a language without an explicit nun like Python has, which almost breaks the Boolean logic from being bivalent or true-false, right? We talk about binary logic, true-false, and immediately, immediately, if you do impose that on people, they're going to have the logical objection. Well, what if I don't know? What if maybe you say, here's blah, blah, blah. Now, true or false? You must say true or false. And you don't want to say either one. It's kind of a human freedom to not 
So I'd say three-valued logic is important. You don't want to have to say true or false. That can be very misleading. Too many interrogations are dumb in that way. It's like, you know, you forgot about context. You forgot about the universe. You forgot that's not the language I speak. There's no answer in your language. There might be, but I never, it's not me to answer true or false. Okay, back to this guy. I'm showing off the standard library decimal now in lots of other videos. In fact, the one that I'm really mirroring the most, by the way, I posted this in the Python Facebook group, but very buried in answer to a question about representing integers in variable numbers of bytes because Python does have a long integer type that is not confined like a C integer or a Rust integer to some finite number of bytes. That's something that most computer languages have, have accepted as that the uh, hardware gives you these bricks and you're going to define your types basically in terms of the number of bricks. But of course if you think of a Unicode object it could be a string for example. A string can be as long or short as it needs to be to, to fill memory. It's got more of a um, sense of being a vector, an array, a list, every letter is, you know, so it's a collection type object. Well, you can think of numbers that way too, as variable length uh, storages, and then they're treated in certain ways, just like strings are. They have their operations, but there's no specific chunk size. So that was the general topic of this thread, but I used it as a bridge to this article on Medium, and you'll recognize that screenshot. It's what we've just been looking at live in my VS Code. And what we're doing is defining, first of all, we're bemoaning in a kind of a theatrical way, calling it heartbreak or disillusionment, a discovery that some people come across and it's rather like disturbing, which is these floating point numbers, IEEE 754 and other conventions, they, they can't fit infinite digits into finite amount of space, you only got four bricks or whatever, and you got to do what, pi? Obviously there's truncation, you could call it error, up to a point you might say, but then the universe truncates too, because nobody uses pi to infinite digits, not even the universe. You could say that, you could be philosophical about it. And there is philosophy always creeping through the cracks in this area where we're at now, where we're trying to represent quantities, but we only have a certain number of bits to do it in, and the floating point standard is very smart, and I have great respect for it, and I use it all the time, and everybody does, and we love it. But if you're doing money computations or extended precision is not enough, what they call extended precision, we want to go to arbitrary precision. And a good example of a truly mathematically oriented software package that does this is Mathematica, Wolfram language where your precision is built in, right? You need a hundred decimal points of accuracy throughout this computation, just dial that in. It's part of the language that you specify basically how many digits of precision. And this is the kind of power we were hoping from computers because it's too tedious and too manual and takes too many lifetimes and too much management to get human computers to be doing all these digits. So we come to computers with that expectation. They've promised us that we don't have to pay a staff of 10,000 people, sit down. So where's that horsepower? Because these floating points don't do it for me. That can be the attitude. And I'm reassuring people in this essay that, yeah, we can take you far beyond. We can't take you to infinite digits. And I think a lot about the infinite digit issue. Like if you write pi, mirror it around a decimal point. So you go 3.3 .3, and then you do 13.31 and then you do 413.314 and you keep adding on both sides the digits of pi. So you start at the decimal point and you, sh you add digits left and right. And you go on, you could say forever, but you're not allowed to sort of. Because we don't, we're leery about numbers with infinite digits unless they're convergent to the right of the decimal. Once you pop that decimal point out right at the 3, 3 there at the center, you've lost it as a number now. It's not, you could, you, it's, it's interesting, right? So I think about that because natural numbers don't have infinite digits. You can't allow that. 
Okay, so moving on down, we get to, I'm kind of making fun of, I'm really just hoping people will go back and read some good old fancy conversation between early Pythonistas, pioneers, where they kind of berate this guy for coming into a forum and wishing it was easier to use these more schoolish numbers that conform to our Platonic expect expectations versus this working class engineering approximation stuff that's not pure enough. And of course, these are engineers and they fight back and defend floating point, kind of dodging his question to which it seems he probably knows the answer. So they, they're taking this as a rhetorical battle. But I just branch off it and say, you know, he's got a point. We really do just want to live in this perfect world sometimes of almost infinite digits, which of course they're not even close, but here we've got uh, precision set to 900 digits. And unlike GIMPy or GMPY, GIMPy2, where bits is what you're talking about. How many bits do I want to give over to one of my things? Here, it's like, no, you just say how many digits you want. And this is based on an IBM standard. Seems to me very well thought out and very complex. It exposes a lot more of the API than the floating point has to in terms of what just went wrong, what did I just do? Did I at any point have to round, throw a flag? I say throw a flag, but it may not result in an exception. It's up to you with the context management to decide the rules, right? If you do something inexact, you can have that stop the action, or you can just say, yeah, that happened, you know. So what I do is I define the values of the S module, the E module, Things I learned from David Kosky originally to do, like for example, the, the E module is just uh, second root of two over eight. You could say square root if you want, but you know, triangles work. And times phi to the negative three power. So that's one over phi to the third. And I'm using the Russian Cyrillic phi or F. It's uh, the letter F or F uh, whatever fill the gas tank and uh, I'm, I'm taking the E and the S and creating what's called the S factor. Now the S factor is just the ratio between the E and the S except it's S over E. The S is bigger, you can think 1.080 that's a favorite number in Lost for example which has a geodesic dome. So these are just mnemonic tricks to help you remember the S factor. It's actually a ratio between also the cuboctahedron and the icosahedron in the jitterbug transformation, which I have right here wrapped around my American flag, stuck into some C60. See, the ratio between this cuboctahedron, excuse me, icosahedron and cuboctahedron, smaller, about 18.51 tetravolumes, bigger, 20 tetravolumes, 18.5120. 20 over this 18.51, except it's not 18.51, that's an approximation, and uh, it's always an approximation. Everything's relative, and approximation is kind of like quantum uncertainty or whatever. So that ratio is the same as the S to the E module, and I use that in these computations to uh, about 100 digits, wait, 900 digits, is it? And I compare like Phi, the phi I get by going square root of 5 plus 1 over 2, all over 2, with the published phi on the internet somewhere, just to prove we get the same answer. Then I make sure, I know my readers probably don't know, this is 2020, they don't know what the S module is, they don't know what the E module is, but I've got all of these memes ready for them so they can quickly come up to speed, and therefore they're crossing the bridge from Python into into American literature. The E modules are 1 1 20th of this diamond faceted 30 faced polyhedron and that's one of our CCP balls there you know that packs to form the IVM. I'm not going as slowly through those concepts in this channel as I do in the essay because these people are just coming up to speed coming from Python Whereas I'm presuming some of you are already well versed in this material and you've heard my channel videos in other contexts and so you already know about the jitterbug 
and you you've already read synergetics you already know the bucky stuff right that's not what you're here to learn you're going the other way across the bridge you want to see how do we express in python that if i take 24 s modules the volume of which i express in terms of phi or phi i say phi and pack them around this icosahedron do i get the octahedron of volume 4 into which you, you get that now when you fill the space that's missing between this faces flush icosahedron inside the octahedron. When you fill in the extra space, sometimes I've 3, 3D printed these guys with S modules, which plane net is here. Once you do that, you, you should get the octahedron of volume 4, which means, by the way, that this, this icosahedron is not the one from the jitterbug but one that's quite a bit smaller. And one way we can get it is to start with a cube octahedron of volume 2.5, so one eighth of the cube octahedron of the jitterbug and apply the S factor twice. Bigger, bigger. So it's changing the edge length actually, so it's not really a jitterbug transformation in this case. You're going from a cube octahedron with faces flush to an octahedron to an icosahedron with the same, its its faces are flushed to the same octahedron faces. So it's kind of like a triangle tilts inside of a bigger triangle and gives us all these interesting angles. And whoa, it's like a jitterbug, but it's in the context of this sort of other transformation where we stay flush to the octahedron's faces. And it, it, it works out that two applications of the S factor take us from the cube octahedron of 2.5 to this icosahedron inside. So we, we're going to do that. We're going to start at 2.5 2 volume, apply the S factor twice, times S factor, times S factor, and that's going to get us the volume of that icosahedron, to which we're then going to add 24 times the S module. And how close do we end up? at 4 in that case. So we're going to need decimal representations of phi, root of 2, root of 5, compute, all these things. And uh, here's a 2 frequency you could say, how should I say it? Actually more like half frequency. This is an IVM context for the octahedron where a single ball, the way we're thinking of this octahedron is having volume um, Four, a single ball would go from a center and be tangent to the other ball where um, we, we would be putting points at the kissing points between the balls. Well, we don't, that's, we're doubling the frequency. So in a sense, I'm saying this is higher frequency IVM than the octahedron inside because we're taking that oct octahedron to have unit IVM links and yet we've already subdivided. We've got a higher frequency with the IVM here. You get that? So if that's volume 4, we're just saying it is. We stipulate that this octahedron is the volume 4 octahedron vis-a-vis -vis like uh, this giant 2 frequency one that takes up the whole rest of the corner. That would have relative volume of 1, right, compared to the 4. And this littler octahedron inside would be 1 eighth of the 4. So four times one eighth, this would be one half the volume. This would be volume one half. And these guys would be one eighth, the tetrahedrons around it. So just establishing that as a context, again, reminding you that this is one of those IVM balls with E modules. We um, apply the S factor and we want to make sure that the S factor times the S factor times the decimal 2.5 is going to equal, once we add in the icosahedron, so the icosahedron within, the one inside the uh, octahedron, right? We're going to obtain that from the inner cube octahedron by multiplying by the S factor twice. And then we're going to add to that icosahedron within, now that we've obtained it, we're going to add the 24 S modules and see how close we come to 4. Because 4 is the total volume then of the cube octahedron, and of, excuse me, the octahedron. And here's our answer in Python 3.8, but it would be the same in 3.7, 3.6, whatever. It's not quite 4.
it's got a little bit of a rounding error towards the end. And that's just because, again, we don't have infinite digits. We have to draw the line somewhere and allow for some truncation or approximation. And we're used to doing that in a discrete mathematics context, such as Mathematica or Python. So you can see now how your peers in the Python world are using are able to use Python as kind of a doorway into your world in American literature, where you have synergetics embedded as a philosophy with an implied futurism and so on. You want more information, I will put in the uh, YouTube commentary this link to a Jupyter Notebook at my GitHub repo, which walks you through all the same information, a slightly different way, different metaphors, and uses GIMPy2 instead of the decimal library. So you get another approach, different library, and this is Python probably 3.6, it won't matter. And uh, I look forward to seeing you soon in the next video.